Hi everyone, today is a very special show that I am offering to you. My guest is a neurosurgeon, a rational mind. Nevertheless, his, his coma experience, induced by a meningitis, drastically changed his way of apprehending death brain functions. He tells his story in the book, The Proof of Heaven. Eben Alexander, hello, and thank you for accepting to be there with us today. Well, Philippe, thank you so much for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be discussing this with you and, and sharing uh, not only my experience, but also the scientific repercussions uh, that I've realized over the last uh, 13 years. Merci beaucoup, Eben. Thanks a lot, Eben. As a first question, of course, I could not pass on asking you this, but as a neurosurgeon, how did you see the notion of consciousness prior to this experience? Well, I had been brought up in a very conventional um, scientific background. I taught more than 15 years at Harvard Medical School. All of it ba was based in what is known as physicalism. That is the notion that only the physical world exists. And... Uh, So I thought when, when the brain and body die, conscious awareness ends. But I discovered in my experience that that's the opposite of the truth, and that our consciousness is actually much grander at the time uh, that we uh, end as physical beings. Alors, votre expérience, quand elle a commencé, votre NDE When you went through NDE, there was a first step that you called the Earthworm's Eye View. Could you tell us more about it? Well, important to point out, uh, one of the unusual features of my NDE was amnesia, that I had no memories of Eben Alexander's life, of this earth or universe. It really was an empty slate, which was very important for the journey. It all began in that earthworm's eye view, a very primitive course, unresponsive realm, like being in dirty jello or underground had a strong memory of roots or blood vessels, uh, some tangibles around me, but I had no body awareness. Uh, and it sounds like a kind of a dark and foreboding start, which it was, but luckily uh, it led into much richer and more brilliant territory. Alors, c'est devenu beaucoup plus lumineux. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous raconter le passage More bright. Could you tell us about this transition from a dark world to this magical paradise? Yes, I had spent what seemed like a very, very long time in that earthworm eye view, but then there came this slowly spinning white light. It had a perfect musical melody associated with it. And as that came towards me, slowly spinning, uh, out of the kind of muck of that uh, earthworm eye view, it opened up like a light portal up into this brilliant ultra-real gateway valley that was filled with many Earth-like features. It was much more real than this world, filled with meaningful detail and, and uh, kind of emotional truth. And uh, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Millions of other butterflies, uh, beings down below that I labeled as souls between lives, and this beautiful spiritual companion, my guardian angel, who accompanied me on the butterfly wing. When you entered that light, did you start asking yourself questions like you would have if you were in your physical body? Did you ask yourself scientific questions since you are, after all, a man of science? Not at the time it was occurring. That was the value of the uh, amnesia, was I just lived it and went through this extraordinary experience that basically seemed to be run by the universe, so that loving God force to show me all these uh, beautiful uh, kind of senses of connection. Uh, and the richness and ultra-reality were beyond description, absolutely not something that one with a materialist mindset would predict could happen. Alors, est-ce que vous pouvez nous décrire quelque chose que vous avez décrit dans votre livre euh, « La preuve du paradis » Can you describe to us this world that you described in your book, Proof of Heaven, as a world of complete darkness, but at the same time full of light? It's really difficult to picture for us who didn't experience this. Well, that was really the next level of my journey. So a lot of things happened in this gateway valley that had uh, the earth-like features, but rich spiritual powering to it like swooping angelic choirs above but then i moved to the next level that's what you're talking about 
That was the core realm. And what I actually witnessed was all of space and time in the material realm collapsing down. That entire spiritual level with a different ordering of causality that I call deep time, all of that collapsing down as I ascended through a light portal that again was associated with music, music of those angelic choirs and entered the core. The core is where all paradoxes, all dualities completely resolve into that oneness of kind of experiential knowing and creative power of the universe. The core realm uh, is furthest from any possible description from our earthly language, and yet it is so natural, and many who have had NDEs can identify with that rich sense of that kind of ultimate realm beyond the boundaries of the kind of earth-like level. Est-ce que il est possible, avec des mots humains, encore une fois, de pouvoir décrire cette musique angélique Is it possible to give us a description of this angelic music? What kind of instrument were used? Was it? Well, it was really kind of an idealized form of music. I mean, the actual experience of it, I do not believe could be duplicated by any kind of music in this realm. Uh, although I've heard beautiful music in this realm that to me had kind of the emotional resonance Uh, with what I heard on my journey. And that would be, uh, for example, uh, some of the real classics like uh, uh, Green Sleeves is a perfect kind of melody that uh, resembles, in my mind, what I heard that ushered me from the earth where my view up into the Gateway Valley. And then I would have to resort to some of the most beautiful uh, uh, music uh, of, say, Samuel Barber or... Uh, the uh, just really rich uh, Pavarotti, uh, you know, some of the most uh, soul-rending music of, from uh, beautiful opera or something like that. I mean, it's really just extraordinarily rich, and um, the closest overlap would be some with some of the most beautiful uh, kind of eternal pieces of classical music that I've ever heard. Claire, Claire de Lune, Debussy, um, you know, music like that. Alors, tout à l'heure, euh, vous parliez de la réalité. Euh, C'était une expérience la plus réelle. Later on, you said that this was the most real experience of your life. Has your definition of reality changed since then? How do you consider the world we live in? Well, I would say reality uh, kind of incorporates and uh, analyzes and attempts to explain every bit of human experience. Uh, so that includes not only our consensus reality in these bodies in the material realm, but also dream states um, and, uh, for example, states induced by plant medicines, entheogens, what some people would call psychedelic substances, um, and uh, meditative experiences, uh, uh, prayer, spontaneous epiphany, explaining every bit of what humans ever can and do experience. That is what any kind of notion of an underlying reality needs to support and explain. So it goes far beyond just our consensus reality in this material world. And, and I would simply add, if I could, yes. that uh, any modern statement about consciousness absolutely must incorporate a robust explanation of the findings in quantum physics. Because anyone who thinks the material world exists out there as an objective reality independent of us has not done their homework of where modern quantum physics uh, absolutely demands a mental layer of the universe. Uh, and the primacy of consciousness. Alors, vous parliez tout à l'heure de, de psychotropes, de, de drogues. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez eu la curiosité? You previous, de, previously de, mentioned de, the use of psychotropes. Have you tried to find the door of paradise using some drugs like LSD or mushrooms? Of course, I mean under medical supervision. Well, yes, it turns out uh, 
given so many people uh, trying to uh, connect my journey and my reporting of the journey with uh, DMT experiences, that is dimethyltryptamine, one of the most powerful uh, endogenous uh, psychedelic substances. Um, yes, I uh, did participate in a study, uh, an experience uh, using 5-methoxy DMT, which is the most powerful uh, form of such entheogenic substances. And what I can tell you is, although I believe such substances may give us a very slight glimpse of the same realms that I encountered in my NDE and that so many others have encountered in similar spiritual journeys, uh, the, psych uh, the psychedelic substance is basically like looking through a tiny keyhole and trying to discern what's on the other side of the door compared to the native experience itself, which is much more like the rich, panoramic, uh, all-inclusive penthouse view that you get on, an, on a true, natural, spiritual journey. Uh, from my point of view, meditation uh, centering prayer, these are far more powerful ways of getting to the same territory of NDEs and shared death experience, not the uh, plant medicines or entheogens, uh, because even the most powerful, uh, that 5-methoxy-DMT, really did not uh, remotely hold a candle to what I discerned through my real experience and what I have found through meditation, reflecting on that experience ever since. Is there a difference between post-reanimation delirium and the uh, near-death experience that you had? Well, it's important to point out, as I uh, share in the book uh, Proof of Heaven, uh, there was a vast difference between the deep coma experience, uh, which I remember today as if it just happened yesterday, very rich, detailed memories, uh, and the 36 hours of kind of in and out psychotic, uh, delusional ICU psychosis that I experienced after my coma, after being extubated, after being taken off the ventilator, uh, my brain was still absolutely ravaged by this disease. And I was in and out of uh, these crazy nightmarish uh, situations. But those memories, that kind of craziness of the 36 hours post-coma, disappeared within a week or two of the coma, even though I wrote down as much as I could in the early stages. Um, and I thought all the memories would disappear. But no, the deep, rich, profound, ultra-real spiritual memories from the NDE are as persistent and stable and resilient today as they were right after waking up compared to that kind of psychotic nightmare. Those memories disappeared very quickly. Later, you were talking about the importance of praying to help you reach the state you were, you were in during your NDE. But you also experienced its strength while you were living the NDE, like people, people praying for you. Uh, would you mind talking a bit about it? Yes. Um, it turns out I had cycled through these uh, th three major layers I talked about, the earthworm I view, the gateway valley, and the core, and cycled them multiple times, but always being told in the core, you're not here to stay. You'll be going back. Um, and they weren't kidding. So there came a point where I tried to use the memory of the musical notes of that initial portal I'd seen to help get that uh, usher in that uh, uh, a wormhole that took me up into the Gateway Valley. And it wouldn't work. To say I was sad at that point would be a vast understatement. But I also knew by that point in this journey that I would be taken care of, that I could trust in that God force of the universe uh, to take care of me. That's when stuck down in that kind of murky realm of the earthworms I view, I witnessed thousands of beings around me, not just loved ones, although two in particular uh, I mentioned in the book who were there, my Episcopal uh, preacher, who was also a neighbor and close friend, and his wife. Even though he physically was there 
and shared prayers at the bedside with loved ones, my vision was much grander than that. It included thousands of beings going off into the distance. Um, and I only recognized uh, of Michael Sullivan, the preacher, and his wife in retrospect, not at the time, but their, the visual images were burned in. But the rest of it was this extraordinary expanse of beings, heads bowed, all this murmuring energy coming up to them. And what I called it in my writings weeks later was the power of prayer. Uh, they were basically uh, showing me that that love I experienced in those much purer spiritual realms was also available to us as individual beings interacting with each other uh, through the power of prayer. Est-ce que euh, les émotions sont très différentes our emotions very different when we are outside of our body? Well, I would say that emotions are, are in, in many ways, much more part of the currency of experience in that realm. In this realm, we often use our kind of thinking and thoughts to organize and kind of assess things around us. In that realm, it's much more important to go with the flow of kind of the emotional engagement uh, and interaction uh, to demonstrate uh, so much more about our relationships with others, our actions with others, and how we uh, can kind of see our best performance as souls depends on a much richer kind of engagement with our kind of feelings and emotions around particular events uh, and relationships. Vous avez communiqué avec Dieu, vous le dites dans votre livre. Comment déjà avez-vous communiqué avec lui? As you said in your book, uh, uh, you talked with God while you were in this world and also after going back uh, on the earth. Can you tell us more about it? How is it to be talking with this God? Well, I think the important thing to remember is we've always communicated with God in the mental realm. That goes back thousands of years across all belief systems. In fact, one of the most beautiful lessons of Jesus of Nazareth was that the kingdom of God is within us. What he was saying is connection to that mental layer of the universe is crucial for all of us to kind of come into a deeper understanding of our being. In the core realm, oneness with that deity was something I experienced and enjoyed and bathed in fully. Do not make the mistake of thinking that somebody's little ego mind and their little egocentric concerns uh, is connecting so directly. It's much more a fundamental part of us uh, that exists and expands at the time of uh, near-death experience or death experience uh, that is part of that connection. But we can do it through meditation and prayer. Uh, you don't have to have these extraordinary exotic experiences. And it's really uh, coming into a deeper alignment with that kind of ego voice, that kind of uh, uh, collective unconscious that we share that Carl Jung talked about, but also acknowledging that uh, in modern consciousness studies, there's tremendous evidence for this oneness. Uh, and that in includes our, our becoming one with that God force and bathing in that love and an NDE, which is what so many NDEers describe. And I would simply add, though, that it was very clear to me in coming back to this world that, you know, I referred to that infinitely loving God as Alm, but don't get lost pretending that your definition of whether that's God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, that any of those are wrong. It's important to acknowledge that deity, as so many indie ears were share, no matter what their religious background, is one of love, compassion, mercy, kindness, acceptance. And that's in agreement uh, with Jesus of Nazareth, but also with so many other prophets who teach love and connection, and that that God force is very benevolent and not judgmental. Have you changed your views on religions after your NDE? Yes, I, I would say uh, my deepest kind of feeling of belief about it all is still very much in alignment 
with uh, much of what I, uh, I learned in a Methodist church growing up about love and kindness and taking care of others. Now, um, also, it was absolutely clear to me that reincarnation is real. Uh, there was no way that I could buy into the narrative that our existence is birth to death and nothing more. That did not ring true. And then after my coma, I studied the scientific evidence for reincarnation, which is indisputable. So in that sense, my religious beliefs did change, but they still stay very close to love, compassion, mercy, kindness, and acceptance for all fellow beings, which I think is present in most religions and in non-religious ethical systems as the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. That's exactly what life reviews in NDEs have taught us for thousands of years, because in a life review, your boundaries of self disappear, and the experiences are often from the per emotional perspective of those around you who are impacted by your actions and thoughts. Est-ce que comme Vanina Chirinsky, qui a été un peu l'intermédiaire pour que cette interview se fasse, like Vanina Shavinsky, our mutual contact, thanks to who this interview happens, have you been given some insight on our future that might be disclosed to you throughout your, your life? Well, yes, I, I mentioned briefly in Proof of Heaven, but I did have these absolutely astonishing visions of uh, civilizations advanced far, far beyond where humanity is now. And I saw how, in fact, this awakening of consciousness that I believe is happening right now, uh, based on NDEs and other exotic examples of consciousness about the nature of reality, um, is helping humankind come into a much deeper understanding uh, of these profound relationships that are necessary for us to actually join these advanced civilizations uh, that represent the evolution of uh, sentience and, and uh, uh, of consciousness uh, of the cosmic mind. And we're really sharing in that beautiful process of evolution. Uh, and that's why I'm very optimistic about the world now, even though People look at the polarization and threats of warfare and things like that. It's very frightening. And yet the reality is they're part of our wake-up call, that to, very, to survive, we must move beyond our false notions of separation that were inherent in materialist thinking. And uh, so it's a, a beautiful uh, future for humanity as we grow into this much more mature version of wisdom and truly make homo sapiens become wise. Et pour vous, est-ce que vous avez constaté des changements sur vos émotions euh, peut-être comme Have you noticed any changes regarding your emotions or maybe extra sensorial capacities? Well, you know, during the events of my coma, no, because I was being led along and I was amnesic for the life of Eben Alexander. But after waking up and then through this 13-year process that is still ongoing of assimilating, uh, yes, everything has changed dramatically. I'm far more intuitive, empathic. Um, uh, I think the meditation itself has contributed tremendously. My whole worldview flipped 180 degrees from that former materialist model of false separation to a more quantum informed uh, consciousness model where all is unified and we're all in this together and it's all about that binding force of love so everything changed for me in a very positive direction Alors, vous avez fait l'expérience que la conscience était créatrice quand vous étiez hors de votre, de votre corps physique Est-ce que vous vous êtes posé la question que même votre voyage You experienced that consciousness was something very creative during your journey out of your body. Did you consider that maybe all of this was just an illusion created by your brain? That's a beautiful question and that gets right to the heart of the medical details that I presented in Proof of Heaven as well as a medical case report 
that was written by three physicians who were not involved in my care, uh, but were fascinated by this miraculous recovery. And uh, the extraordinary uh, facts that I presented and that those doctors presented about my case make it crystal clear my brain could not have uh, experienced any dream or hallucination during that seven-day coma. The evidence is crystal clear from all the damage to my neocortex. Uh, if you read the medical case report, uh, which is available on my website at ebonalexander.com with the September 2018 blog posting, but you'll realize there's no way that this experience was a hallucination or kind of dream or confabulation because my brain was gone. It was inactivated. That's why the scientific community takes my experience so seriously because it has a tremendous amount to inform us about how consciousness is not created by the brain at all. The brain is a filter or transceiver, but our consciousness is ultimately something much richer and more eternal than that. Was it hard to talk about all of this when you got out of coma? Did your scientific friends believe you or did they just think, oh, okay, Eben Alexander, he lost his mind. How did it happen for you? So when I first came back, uh, my brain was still wrecked and my neuroscience and neurosurgery knowledge was still months away from coming back to me. Uh, so when I tried to tell my doctors about my NDE, they would just tell me how sick I was, how they couldn't believe I was even coming back to this world. But they said, the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks so you can forget about it. And I said, okay. Uh, I knew I needed to record it because to me, the experience was so wild and extraordinary that I wrote everything down. But then uh, it turns out that within weeks, as I'm going back to my doctors, they're explaining, uh, you know, we're discussing my medical records, neurologic exams, scans, lab values. I mean, this was not a brain that could have put together any kind of dream or hallucination at all. Uh, and that's what's so extraordinary. Now, my doctors, uh, even though they could hear me talk about this NDE and, and maybe say, wow, how crazy, they were absolutely stricken by my recovery, which defies medical uh, training and logic. And uh, there's no explanation for it. It really seems like a true medical miracle. So, in fact, within a few months, my uh, fellow physicians, uh, not just who took care of me, but the entire community in our hospital, asked me to give a talk at a dinner one night that had more than 120 fellow doctors and their spouses to describe my experience and share it all richly. They obviously knew something amazing had happened. Now, many doctors, scientists, uh, et cetera, have, nurses have been in touch with me and, and grateful for my sharing of my story since then. And I've worked with scientists around the world who are interested in consciousness. For example, I'm one of the 100-plus scientific advisors to GalileoCommission.org. So if you go to their website, you'll understand this big revolution in science around consciousness that we're all talking about. And my case is a very essential part of that discussion. Uh, but the scientific community, to me, has been extremely supportive and uh, run with my experience just as I have because of, of how much it tells us about the nature of reality. So... Uh, for those who think that scientists, you know, debunk and deny Eben Alexander, the exact opposite is the truth. I would simply add to that, uh, if people go to BigelowInstitute.org, there are 29 essays that were just written last year by professionals around the world to answer the question, what is the best scientific evidence for survival of consciousness beyond permanent bodily death. And those 29 essays are all right there for the reading at BigelowInstitute.org, and many of them refer to my case uh, and its importance in this discussion. What would the Eben Alexander from before your NDE think of a case such as yours? 
Well, given all the uh, information that's unfolded, including this third book, which really goes beyond proof of heaven in telling my story uh, and the scientific implications of it, Evan Alexander before coma would have been absolutely fascinated and would now know without even needing that personal experience that the afterlife and reincarnation are absolutely real, that our consciousness is not created by the brain and that it's a much richer journey of discovery to understand how we relate to the universe and the fundamental nature of consciousness and reality. Uh, can you tell us more about this last book that you wrote? Yes. Um, it's uh, basically, uh, you know, Living in a Mindful Universe is our uh, uh, English title, but and it's been endorsed by many of the scientific leaders of con modern scientific consciousness studies around the world. Uh, and it's because it really ties together my experience with so much of what I've learned in the last 13 years scientifically about the brain-mind relationship and the nature of consciousness. This book was co-written with my life partner, Karen Newell, discusses the tremendous work we've done in helping people get into deep meditative states using uh, uh, a product of her company. Her company can be found at sacredacoustics.com. Uh, I use those meditations uh, every day for an hour or two. I've used them to return to my NDE. We've shared them with the NDE community. And really, the book is not only uh, supportive of all the science and this revolution in science around consciousness, but also a tremendous practical guide for the individual seeker who wants to develop meditative techniques to find their own connection with the universe. So the, uh, this book is a, a very rich resource for anyone interested in this discussion. I would like to finish with this last question before thanking you all. What would be your words for a dying person to give them some sense of comfort? I would simply say that there are hundreds of thousands of experiences out there, uh, if not millions, that actually show that the, what happens when we leave the physical body and when our brain and body die is an expansion uh, of awareness, of conscious awareness, and a reuniting with souls of departed loved ones, with an infinitely loving uh, and healing God force, and that there's absolutely nothing to fear about death, uh, that we all are in this together, uh, and it's a very comforting thing to go through. Um, and as important as our lives are here and, and living that life to the fullest, um, crucial to remember that we're much more than just these physical bodies existing birth to death. I am sure this will reassure a lot of people and answer a lot of questions, like me, for example. Thank you so much, Eben. Would you like to maybe add something before I conclude with the, with the acknowledgements? Well, just that uh, no soul left behind. This really involves all of us, this awakening process uh, for humanity at large. Um, and uh, just join in the great uh, kind of joy and optimism that this kind of awareness can bring to us all. Uh, bring that love and sharing into your heart, share it with all that you know, and this whole world will become a far better place. Eben Alexander, thank you for sharing all of this with us and for your availability. Um, thank you, Chiara, for the translation. Thank you to you who watched this video. Do not hesitate in, share, in sharing it if you like it. I would also like to tell you that my channel lives greatly thanks to you and thanks to your donation. There will be there is a PayPal Merci link beaucoup, in the Philippe. description Very good if you wish to today. support my work. Many many many, many thanks to all of Please you pleasure. who will.